One of the interesting chapters in the history of Chinese manuscripts is the use of characters produced by or introduced by Empress Wu during her short-lived Zhou Dynasty. The figure of Empress Wu is well known to anyone studying Chinese history because she was the only female emperor, so she was not a consort or a wife of an emperor, an empress, but she was actually the ruler herself. So after a longer period while she was gaining power, she took over the Tang throne and established her own dynasty, setting herself up as the ultimate ruler. So if you want to make this distinction, she was actually an emperor rather than an empress. But we normally still refer to her as Empress Wu or Empress Wu Zetian. So she basically disrupted the Tang dynasty and set up an entirely new dynasty, which she called Zhou, on the model of the ancient Zhou dynasty. This Zhou dynasty only lasted 15 years, after which she abdicated and then died a few months later. But during her reign, she implemented lots of reforms and restructured the entire society, basically eliminating the Tang ruling class. And many of her measures were symbolic in nature, for example, changing the reign titles quite often. But one of these symbolic measures was the introduction of new forms for 18 characters. And these characters we see in manuscripts and inscriptions. And so they're quite striking because they're very different from how these characters looked like initially. If we look at some manuscripts, here we see manuscript S238 from the British Library. It's a beautifully produced Taoist text with this very striking yellow color. And at the end, we see this colophon. And in the colophon, we immediately notice a number of strange characters, which are not typically part of Chinese writing. And these are the so-called Empress Wu characters. They're called in Chinese Wu Zhou Xinzi, or in Japanese, Sokten Moji, because in both countries, these characters have been circulating for a while and still can be seen on many manuscripts or inscriptions. So even in this little colophon, we see in the first line, a number of them. For example, here, it says Ru Yi Yuanyan in the first year of the Ru Yi reign. And in this date, the character Nian for the word year is written in this unusual form. And this is a form she came up with or her advisors came up with based on ancient inscriptions. So it's actually like a pseudo archaic form for a character. But then immediately after that, we have the character Yue for moon uh, written in this way. And then we have the character Zhi for sun or day, also written in an unusual way. So the inscription actually says that in the first year of the Ru Yi reign, in the intercalary fifth month on the 13th day, and then it goes on to explain who wrote the manuscript and so forth. Now, in another manuscript, we see a similar phenomenon. So we have manuscript S217 here which is the well-known Buddhist scripture, Guan Shi Yin Jing, that is the 25th chapter of the Lotus Sutra. And at the very end, we see the colophon heavily indented. And if we look at the first line of this colophon, we can see again, a number of strange characters, which might not be familiar to us immediately. And what it is, the first character is the character Tian, heaven, and it's written again in this archaic form. This form in particular comes from an archaic way of writing the character Tian. So Tian Se Wan Sui Er Nian. And so in the second year of the Tian Se Wan Sui reign, which was one of her reign titles. And in this date, the character Nian for year is written again in this fancy alternate form. And after that, we have three more Empress Wu characters. So one is for Zhong proper or standard for Zheng Yue, so the first month. Both the Zheng and the Yue are written in this form. And then finally, uh, the character Zhi for day is also written in this way. An interesting thing for both of these manuscripts is actually that in the colophon we see these characters, but in the main text we don't, or sometimes not so much. Because occasionally we can see that they're also used in the main text, but not so consistently. Here's, for example, the collection of the occurrences of the character D, Earth, in manuscript S243. 
And we can see that this Wu Zetian form, which is written in a very interesting way as Shan Shui Tu, so mountain, water, soil, representing earth. So it's kind of like a semantic composite that makes up the meaning of the character. And so that form occurs only twice, whereas the standard, the normal form, occurs a couple of dozen more times. So this use was not necessarily always so consistent. But we can see that the colophons were more observant of this rule, much more so than the main text, which quite often was a Buddhist or Taoist scripture. And so there was this authority of the text that also mattered. And perhaps it was not necessary to change the text into this new form. In terms of the characters she changed, it's usually thought that she changed 18 characters and there were 19 forms for these 18 characters. But this is not entirely correct because there were several characters with different forms. For example, the character Guo for state went through several incarnations and so did the character Yue for moon and so forth. So let's say there were about 18 characters and there were maybe a little over 20 forms for them. And one of them was actually her own name, Zhao. She changed the original form into something completely different uh, which consists of the components Ming, bright, and Kong, sky, or emptiness. So bright sky or bright emptiness, which kind of conveys the meaning of jaw, radiate or radiance. So there's no problem with that, of course. The French scholar Françoise Potero, she has a really interesting article about this. Uh, she calls these characters the enigmatic characters of Empress Wu Zetian. And she goes into quite a bit of detail about how each character was formed. What was the rationale behind it? And that's quite interesting because she shows that there were actually different considerations behind them. So you can group them into different categories. So the more interesting ones for us are probably the ones which are composed of these semantically meaningful units. For example, as we've mentioned, the character Joff of Radiance for her own name. We also mentioned the character D, Earth, so it consists of Shan Shui Tu, that is mountain, water, and soil. Really interesting, the character Zhen, standing for the word person, and that was written as Yi Sheng, so one life, or the whole life. Uh, similarly, the character for state, Guo, it was written as Pa Fang, and it was surrounded with a frame, so basically the eight directions within a domain. And apparently this character initially featured her own surname, Wu, meaning Marshall, inside this frame. But then advisors told her that she was kind of inframing herself, limiting herself. And so she changed that concept and she went with the eight directions within these boundaries. Another interesting aspect of these characters is that they were abandoned after 705 when she stepped down from the throne. So they were no longer used. In fact, they were forbidden to be used. But quite interestingly, they continued in different parts of the empire. So when her reign ended, the Tang Dynasty was restored and it was forbidden to use these characters because they were associated with her. And obviously she was a persona non grata, even though she was already gone. But in some parts of East Asia, the characters continued to be used because they were not limited by the tongue restrictions. So, for example, in Japan, where they also spread, they were continued to be used in certain contexts. Here we see, for example, that the name of the temple, Honkokuji, is written with that character. So not only on the temple itself, but actually also on the modern signs, which show people how to get to the monastery. And similar things were happening in Yunnan, which was no longer under Tang rule. So these forms continued to be used for several centuries, even after her death. And finally, there are also a few manuscripts from later periods, from Dunhuang, which feature these characters. So they're not scrolls. This is, for example, a concertina. This form only appeared a couple of centuries after her death. So the appearance of these characters here does not mean that the manuscript was written during her reign. Rather, it means that the manuscript was copied from earlier manuscripts, which were probably written during her reign, and used these characters. So for this, you have Professor Jean-Pierre Treja's article, and he systematically goes through the Dunhuang manuscripts with these types of characters and days them according to the characters and also on a number of other criteria. And he shows that there are actually quite a few of these manuscripts which could not have been written during her reign, but were quite a bit later. 
So all of these characters were quite often used in textual studies to date manuscripts and inscriptions. This is not a fully reliable method because as we've seen occasionally, they are also used in later times. Okay, I hope this little introduction was useful. Thank you for watching and see you next time.